the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I'll let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we pray that your spirit will prevent and prohibit us from thinking that this text just applies to our neighbor. We pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will take this text and help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to truly reflect on our life. Help us to truly see whether or not we are usable in your hands and help us to have the wisdom to discern your work in our lives. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are continuing in our study on the prophet Jeremiah, a study that we have entitled Life Lessons from Jeremiah. We remember that Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was the prophet that prophesied for over 70 years and saw very little fruit in his ministry of prophesying. Very few people listened to him because he was bringing a word of judgment, impending judgment, possible judgment to the people of Jerusalem, judgment that would come unless they repented unless they changed their mind, unless they changed their direction and went a different direction. If you go through the book of Jeremiah, the word repent occurs over 100 times. So we really cannot miss the message in the book of Jeremiah. This morning we're looking at one of the most familiar texts in the book of Jeremiah. It's the story of Jeremiah going down to the potter's house. Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house because God wants to show Jeremiah an illustrated sermon. So Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house. Jeremiah sees the potter making something out of clay and sees that the potter can exert the potter's will over the clay and sees that if the potter so decides the potter can smash the clay vessel and can make something completely new out of it. Now obviously here in this text the text is aimed at the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is being called to repent And if the nation of Israel does not repent, and by the way, they don't, if the nation of Israel does not repent, then God will send judgment on the nation of Israel. And we know from the history of the people of Israel that that judgment came in the form of the people of Babylon. And the people of Babylon came with their armies and destroyed Jerusalem, devastated the temple, and took many of them into exile. Took them to a place where they did not want to be. And Jeremiah was the prophet that was called to say to the people over and over and over that they needed to change. They needed to amend their ways. They needed to think differently and to go in a different direction. Because if the nation of Israel does not do this, they will be smashed and God will refashion them into something else. So here in the text, God is dealing with a nation, the nation of Israel. And just as an aside, I I still believe that God deals with nations. If we as a nation do not repent, if we as a nation do not repent of our pride, our arrogance, our greed, our violence, 
our idolatry, our love of and promotion of immorality, then God will have to judge us just as God judged the nation of Israel because of God's love for us, his creation. But even though here in this text, this text is aimed explicitly at a nation, at a people, I know that we can take this text and draw personal, private, individual implications and applications. And I hope that when the text was read, that your mind went straight to that place where you can start making personal implications and personal applications of this text to your life. I pray that as we continue to look at this text, that the Spirit will give us a grace of honesty. Because I know for many of us, we, or as my grandmother used to say, are set in our ways. We have ways, we have actions, we have activities, we have attitudes, we have dreams that we refuse to relinquish. And it really doesn't matter if God wants something otherwise or not. We want to just keep doing what we've been doing. We want to keep thinking what we've been thinking. We want to keep talking like we've been talking. And we refuse to allow the potter to do anything new with us. So, personal application. I think when I look at this text, I can determine at least three personal applications for each one of us. Number one, the text teaches me that sometimes you've got to be in a certain place. Sometimes you've got to be in the right place in order to hear the word of the Lord. Notice in the text, Jeremiah was told to go to a specific place, the potter's house. Because there in the potter's house, he, Jeremiah, would hear the word of the Lord. Whenever we come into this place, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, we are coming into this place praying that this place will be for us the potter's house. The place where we can hear the word of the Lord. Now we know that God's presence is everywhere. God's, God's presence pervades God's creation. But we also know that God preferences certain places. God preferences certain geography. God's presence is everywhere, but there are only certain places and certain times when we experience God's manifest presence. The place of prayer, the place of serious scripture study, the place of serious Christian community and communion and fellowship, times of fasting, times of earnestly seeking after God. These and other times are places where God will speak God's word to us, sometimes we have to go to some specific places to hear the word of the Lord. I'm glad that we're here this morning because this is one of those places. This place is different from other places. This is one of these places where when we gather as God's people in spiritual unity, in spiritual union, we stand a really good chance of hearing the word of the Lord. The second thing that's, I think, obvious from the text is that we need to make sure we understand that we are the clay. The Bible is very clear that we are clay, not just here in Jeremiah 18, but in other places. You'll recall in the creation account of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we are told that God makes us out of the dust of the earth. And that he breathes life into us. Psalm 103 is one of my favorite psalms. I had a wonderful opportunity recently to teach that psalm to uh, circle number 7, whenever you and I met this women's circle. I love Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 14 reminds us that God knows how we are made and we are but dust. God knows that. God knows the frailty of our nature. We are but dust, we are made from the dust, but because of God's grace working and operating in us, we can become tremendous vessels for God's purposes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says that God in Christ has given us many, many great truths and treasures. 
And we hold these treasures in clay jars or earthen vessels. That's who we are. We are the clay, obviously, in the text. The word human actually is connected to the word humus. We are of the ground. That's who we are. We need God. We need the breath of God working in us in order to become that which God wants us to be. So we are the clay. And then lastly, and I don't know how you could possibly miss this, God is the potter. God is the potter, and we are the clay. God is the one who is seeking to do something new in our lives. I suspect right now, perhaps even in this moment, you can feel the potter's hands involved in your life. As the clay, we have to submit to the potter. We human beings have much more of a will than inanimate clay has. And as human beings, we have the right to yield or not yield to the potter. I know that our text ended at verse 11, but I want you to be sure and see verse 12. If you were to go on reading this text in Jeremiah 18, it says this in verse 12, but they say, the people say, it's no use. We will follow our own plans, and each of us will act according to the stubbornness, the stubbornness of our evil will. As clay, we have to submit to the hands of the potter if we want the potter to do anything in our lives. But the potter is present in our lives, seeking to mold us, to pull us, to push us, to form us. And sometimes it feels like the potter is hurting us. And even when it feels like the potter is hurting us, we need to remember that the potter is never harming us. The potter is just seeking to make something new and beautiful out of us. And the potter works in our lives. And sometimes the potter has to work and rework and rework and rework. And one of the things that tells me is that the potter doesn't quickly throw away the clay. And I'm so glad that the potter does not quickly throw away the clay. I always think about Peter. Remember Peter? Peter was so good at some times in his life. He was so bad at other times in his life. Peter, the one who betrayed Jesus, but who went on to become the leading voice, the leading preacher on Pentecost, who went on to become the leading apostle in the early church because Peter allowed the potter to continue to mold, to pull, to push, to form. One day Peter was on the seashore there by the Sea of Galilee and Jesus was with him and Jesus was working on him and Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That's the hands of the potter working on Peter. I'm so glad, and I hope that you're glad this morning, that the potter doesn't quickly throw the clay away. But the potter continues to work on the clay. And sometimes I'm sure the clay feels like it's being hurt. But we need to remember that while we're being molded and pulled and pushed and formed, we're not being harmed. That's the hands of a potter that we can trust. That's the hands of a God that has a parent heart toward each one of us. And then after the potter works on us a little while and gets us where the potter wants us to be, the potter then many times may take us and put us in the fire, put us in a kiln, put us in the fire, and I suspect that some of you right now here in this room feel the heat of the fire. And I encourage you to trust. I encourage you to feel the hands of the potter and recognize that heat as being that which perfects the work of the potter. 
Because you see, the potter wants to get us to the place where we are a beautiful, usable vessel in the hands of the potter. I don't know what your greatest aim or desire in life is. But for God, the greatest aim and desire for you and I is that we will be usable, beautiful vessels in the hands of the potter. I do suspect that many of you right now here in this place feel the hands of the potter. I've said to you several times over the last few years, and this text begs me to say it again, that if you want to see where God is working in your life right now, probably the best place to look is look at that place in your life where you're the least comfortable. That may be, may be, where the potter is molding and pulling and pushing and forming you into a more beautiful, usable vessel. Now, I know it's hard because we do cherish our ways. We're set in our ways. And someone who's set in their ways cannot be refashioned by the potter. But I pray that you will trust the hands of the potter. The Spirit needs to finish this message in your lives because the potter works in each one of our lives in very different ways. But we know that the potter is working in our lives. And we know that we can trust the hands of the potter. Amen.